Oh, naturally, naturally, the Patreon get this first. Uh, matter of fact, I don't even know when the uh, regular YouTube gonna get it, but the Patreons get it first, you know. Uh, a lot of people don't, some people know. Um, it's no big secret, but back in the 90s, you know, people weren't getting merchandising deals. And like they doing now, you know, now they was getting a Louis Vuitton. They talking about Birkin bags and all this stuff. And, but back then, big brands weren't dealing with hip hop. Even though hip hop was pushing it to a billion dollar industry. Most of the major companies like Louis and all that, they weren't dealing with hip hop. That was some back alley stuff to them. No matter all the mo multi-millions of records they were selling they got artists going diamond and they weren't really checking for them so you know Versace when Biggie was talking about that and Pac started doing Dolce and Cabana and, and doing all this stuff for little Kim that's when it started to really open some doors and you know and getting all these uh, brands in there that was starting to open up who really didn't cater to hip-hop now everybody had their little hip-hop moment where they made some shirts you know you know like dada and all these other people that was in the game so dada was giving out free free gear to like all the rappers you was up and coming rapper you know come around get some free gear you know and they'll let you rock it so they was like look take what you can get and you could bounce up out of here and just start, you know, rocking with your clothes, rocking what you wear. And, you know, that was it. That was the main thing you do. You know, rock what you wear and get up out of there. And then Rock Aware came out the Dada and all these other ones, the academic gear and, you know, Anisi, all the brands. So... While all these companies were starting to get their niche and all this stuff, Carl Canal was out, and you had Willie Esco that Nas used to promote. So, Nas was the uh, Carl Canal and Esco King. <laughs> That's what they called him, the Willie Esco model and the Carl Canal. They used to dress him down and give him gear. But Mob D, they were considered to be unmarketable. You know what I'm saying? So Wu-Tang, they were considered to be unmarketable. But what Wu-Tang did and what RZA came up with the idea was that logo was bigger than, was bigger than the group. That logo is merchandise. People were going out of their way to make their own Wu-Tang earrings, Wu-Tang medallions. The, the, the dude in the uh, bodegas and the, the Arabs on the corners, they beat all the rappers. They beat everybody to the gear, everything. They beat all the artists, everybody, because they have them chains made. Hey, my friend, my friend, come here, come here, my friend, come here, look at this, look at this, my friend, look at this, this is, this is 14 karat gold, 14 karat, Wu-Tang medallion, you like the Wu-Tang? <laughs> so, they always have a special price, they have a special price for you, my friend, just a special price, just for you, my friend, so, <laughs> This was the mentality going into it. So, RZA made like, oh my God, RZA walked away with Wu Wear. They, they capped in about 20 some million dollars. They were making millions off of Wu Wear. And I think Prodigy was like, man, because Chris Lighty saw what was happening. And he was talking to Chris Lighty. He's like, you know, see if you can set me up with these, uh, you know, the right people so they can check it out because I want to do an infamous, you know, 
we do our infamous records, you know, put our record label on shirts, and then, you know, fans want to buy them, they can buy them. So Chris set it up where they can present it to some of these retailers, and the retailers was like, eh, nah, not interested. Now, they would have jumped at it years ago. So what they just decided to do was sell it out of some couple of record stores, print up a few shirts, and then, you know, P just got the big idea. Instead of selling it out of everybody else's store, let's sell it out of our own store. We're going to get our own thing. And they went and got a spot in Harlem. Now, Mom D is QB all day. So it would be perfect if they got it in Queens. But it was cheaper to acquire it in, in uh, Harlem, in the area they was in. So, on that strip that they was on, you know, they had the store... And P was spending so much money trying to keep it up and put money into it that he was going to go broke. Because they sitting over here trying to film the movie. And the director of the movie is like fighting with them, you know, over budget and trying to get things done to get the film finished. And then you got P worrying about a doggone store to try to sell some clothes. And Havoc is like, hey, man, <laughs> you know, we need to finish all this stuff up. Because the, the movie was basically more P than Havoc. Like, like, Prodigy was really pushing this movie. Like, dude, we could put out a movie and, you know, you see how these dudes are doing it in New Orleans. You know what I'm saying? They coming up making movies. And Master P came in the game doing these little feature films, like Bout It, Bout It, and all that. These was like movies. And he was like, man, we could push that straight through the hood and make clear about a million easy. Sell about a million units of these or 500,000 of the movie. You know what I'm saying? That's, we'd be making 700,000 plus the upside. So... You looking at the going rate would have been the buying rate and the demand of a movie like Murder Music and everything else. That would have just kept growing. So he's thinking that's going to help advertise the clothing line. But he had to make a decision because the money wasn't right. And Chris Light is telling him, like, man, financially, you ain't going to be able to cut it. Because y'all don't have anything really popping up. And Steve Rifkin wasn't releasing the budget money. For the second album. See what Mob Deep was doing. They was recording like three albums at the same time. They was recording three albums. They was uh, doing the uh, what was that? Murder Music. Then the HNIC. And then Havoc album. Havoc album was being done at the same time. So it was three albums being recorded. So. That was the plan. Somebody was like, no, man, Havoc, I mean, Prodigy was trying to make moves in case he had to bounce. I mean, he might have said that in his mind, but the plan was for them to try to follow Wu-Tang. Because that's what Steve Rickon was like, look, just like Wu-Tang had the Wu-Tang album, then everybody branched out and got a solo deal. But we're going to keep everything in-house. Like, you would have it come out with y'all solo projects, and then that'll be that. So, the album kept getting delayed. They had photo shoots and everything. The album was supposed to come out. They pushed the album back. And, you know, P will lose it. Like, dude, we did all this, wasted all this money on promotion. You know, he did a photo shoot where he's sitting on a block of ice like George Gervin. And, and then the album don't come out. So now he's living. Because they were having financial problems, the record company itself, Loud Records, because Wu-Tang was the big money winner there, and Mob Deep, 
Besides that, they had signed too many artists and groups that albums didn't really take off on Loud Records. Like they had the Beat Nuts, I think, and the Alcoholics. They had a lot of groups, but they just weren't selling that the records to cover the upkeep. And something was happening with the finances that wasn't up to par. So decisions had to be made. Now, when they opened up the store, as soon as they opened it up, it was problems with, guess who, dudes from Harlem. Because you got all these Queensbridge dudes hanging out in Harlem. And some Harlem cats over there don't like it. And the Queensbridge dudes ain't going to back down. <laughs> so now they're shooting at each other in the park. <laughs> Welcome to Queensbridge. <coughs> QB So you go from that You go from that To the store getting shut down I think the city Or the mayor or somebody shut them down And all that stuff saying I think that's what they were saying Like oh damn they shut it down It's too violent Somebody got popped over there but in reality, P couldn't afford it. It was like twenty five hundred a month, and he couldn't afford the rent and the upkeep and the hiring the staff. He couldn't do all that, and not with the movie and everything. He couldn't keep the the budget up, and then they weren't really releasing and the extra budget money. <clears throat> That's why they kept delaying the H and I C album. Then it was released poorly. So, a lot of these things come into play when you're um, when you're trying to get things accomplished. Because when you're trying to get things accomplished, the last thing you need is somebody to get in your way and slow you down. That disrail everything that you're trying to do, all the process, the whole notions, all of it, really. So, a lot of people blame Cam. <laughs> I they was like, man, Cam and them dudes, man, Cam was hating because he wanted a Harlem World store, but Mace wasn't down with it, and Harlem World belonged to Mace. But he he wanted one that like he was bad. How do these Queensbridge dudes come over here and get property? What's up with this peanut butter and jelly stuff, Rozzy? <laughs> How these Queensbridge niggas come over here and get property, man? I mean, they just come over here and nobody say nothing. You know, I've been moving a couple of, you know, a little couple of gems. I mean, we could have put money together and we could have had something, man. We could have did Harlem World. You know, we could have did some of that. You know, they, they out there making moves. I ain't hating. I'm just saying, why, why don't you do that in your hood? Why are you coming over here to take money from from all us over here in Harlem? <laughs> so, a lot of people felt Cam was behind the hate, even though he was cool with Nas and and, and the Brave Hearts and Mob Deep, so the Queen Bridge dudes, he was cool with them. But he dealt with them from afar. He really didn't get as close and personal as everybody else did. So... Cam was just particular, if that was the case. But, you know, that part of it, that's just people, you know, putting their two cents in. They're saying Cam was hate. Cam probably was like, it's news to him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, man, financial woes, man. Financial woes. It really lured them to the grounds, putting all their money into a movie, and it didn't even get promoted or distributed right. You know, and you would think now, like imagine if they put murder music out today, what it would have done with the streaming service. They would have made a killer. They would have made a killing on that. So, it's a lot of stuff that went on, man, during those times. Uh... A lot of people didn't know, so.
Yeah, so a whole lot of garbage went on too. Mm, that should cover this for right now. So for my patrons, it's good to see it first. Thank you, as always. And for all of everybody else, hopefully you guys have donated to the Cash App. Carcino is the name on the Cash App. And definitely um, subscribe if you like the videos and hit the notification bell. And we out.